welcome to a brand new episode of the Wooly Thistle Shopcast. We're really happy to be with you again with my co-host Maggie. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and me, Corrine. And uh, we operate the Wooly Thistle, which is an online yarn shop. Starting to hear a lot about Wooly Wool out there, which is great because uh, we love the Wooly Wool. And we'll be talking lots about that, I think, this episode. Do you yeah. agree? I do, yeah. yeah. So we have things to show you. We've got videos for you. And I think, first of all, we should start with a winner. So every episode, we give away a couple of gift cards to the Wooly Thistle. And uh, all you have to do is leave a comment, give us two thumbs up, and be a subscriber to the channel. And the winner this time is Mabel Kirk. Congratulations. You said, love the interview with Kristen Drysdale. I learned so much just in the interview, even though I've been knitting for years. I'll just have to get that book. Mm. I think that's one of the most awesome things about knitting is that even when you know and you've been knitting for a long time, there is so much still to learn. Yeah. And it just, I don't know, there's something really comforting in that, that we can't ever know it all. Um, and the more we learn, the more confident and proficient we are, but it's never, ever ending. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking the other day about how long I've been knitting now, which is a while. <laughs> like, it's probably been a good 20 years where wow. I've just been... Really? Where I've been knitting <clears throat> or regularly. Mm -hmm. Like, I started out crocheting, and um, I've talked about that before, mm -hmm. and um, learning how to knit Continental really was mind-blowing, and I've been <laughs> obsessed ever since. Same. But, yeah. Um... I still feel like in so many ways, like I'm just digging into things. Absolutely. Spinning. Although you're even multi craftual I mean, you do some weaving, you do your spinning. Yeah. I am very... The weaving, I'm like a baby weaver. <laughs> I got to Like, I still don't you. even know all the language for weaving. I'm feeling almost like a siren call or something to weaving. And I've never felt anything like that except for my knitting. So I'm becoming curious about the weaving for yeah. sure. I think you can just do some beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. fabrics. I love fabric. I used to sew before I, well, I knitted before I sewed, but I did learn to sew at a young age. And I don't know, there's, I don't know. There's equipment involved in that. And I think that's why I like knitting so much is that there's really just two sticks and your string and you're good yeah. to go. I love that. But anyway, I am becoming curious about uh, weaving. Anyway, off I go. I can help with that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to make uh, really nice things, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can help with that, but I can at least get you started. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's probably another rabbit hole, much like knitting is. There's techniques is. and there's methods and then there's yeah, a lot of equipment. There's, there's equipment and there's just sort of, um, even just the language of it, like understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's I, not Talking to which, and, yeah. I mean, it took me forever to realize that they weren't saying Richard Heddle. I thought <laughs> it was a Richard Heddle. <laughs> it is rigid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, That's yes, funny. I think, yeah, I don't know why, why are we talking about this? I'm not really even sure. How did we get here? Oh, it's because of our winner. Oh, that's right. She still has so much to learn, even though she's been knitting for a long time. We get that. <laughs> we feel the same way, exactly. Yeah. So congratulations, uh, Mabel, or Mabel. Kirk. Yeah. You, you know, Kirk is a good Scottish name. It means church in Scotland. So um, anywho, uh, just send us an email with winner in the subject line and uh, let us know that you're the winner of the $25 gift card and we'll get it out to you right away. <sighs> I'm so happy to be here talking about wool and yarn and knitting and maybe a little weaving here or there. Yeah. It, it's good, isn't it? I'm excited you're like even interested in weaving. Because <laughs> usually you, you usually have a pretty I'm very area. Yes, I do. Whereas I'm always like, ooh, how does that work? How does that work? Let's, let's well, yeah. That. No, um, well, that's it. And it's sort of bubbling up inside. Like, you know what? I really like, like Hive Tender on Instagram. She is from New Hampshire. I've known her for years and years and years. And she's posting some really beautiful pictures on her loom. Yeah. And that's sort of getting my creative juices going too. She's also a beekeeper. That's something else I want to do. I'd love to have bees. Um, yeah. In my ideal world. There you go. I know. Someday. Someday. That's working on it. I'll come visit your bees. Yeah. Come visit my bees. It's like when I go see Amber, I go visit her sheep. <laughs> I love that. I don't have sheep. I don't. I would like sheep, but I'm digressing, completely digressing. <laughs> <sighs> All right, That's so okay. anyway, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be talking with you about woolly things and just the joy that our hobbies bring us, for sure. 
Um, yes. So what do we want to talk about first? Shall we talk about what we're wearing and what yeah. is newly finished? I finished another sweater. How about that, right? First time too, got it right. Oh, fits. <laughs> <laughs> you're just amazing. That's amazing. So I'll stand up a little yeah. so you can see. So. Yeah. It's um, so lovely. It's knit with two strands of Plotilope, and I sort of faded them throughout. Really nice. So I love, this ones. is my favorite uh, line here with the marling, kind yeah. of marling. Would you say that's marling? What is yeah, that? I mean, it is marling. Yeah. I have the two different together. Um, together. Yeah. So this is a double thickness. And then I thickness. kept the dark in this one. Like, I mm -hmm. always just swapped out one. Which just softens it out all the way to the end. Yeah. So lovely. And this is two strands of Plotilope held yes. together. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, and I love it. It's warm. It's cozy. Um, I keep doing this a little bit. Um, Why? Um, first of all, it's fuzzy, and I like it. <laughs> um, but also, it'll get out some of the any little any little prickly ends. Well, here's it's sort of um, here's the question naturally that wears the down. burning question yes. that everybody wants to talk about: Is it itchy? I don't find it itchy. Um, I it is rustic. Um, I think it depends how sensitive you are to it. Like I think do you have any sleeves? On I do it? have. I have three quarter length sleeves under here because yeah. I, I wanted a boat neck because I wanted the. I didn't want the. Yeah, you didn't want all that itch under. right up there. <laughs> well, like I don't mind. Like this is up against my skin. Yeah. And, um, I wore it the other day. It was completely fine. Yeah. I wear my tree light, which is let low be yep. all the time, and it doesn't bother me. Yep. Um. So. It's not I will say then. I was wearing, I I mean you've seen me. I wear my tree light maybe once a week, mm -hmm. um, especially February when it's cold yeah. here. Um, I wore it Saturday under my coat, and after like three or four hours under my coat, it was bothering me, and huh. it never bothers me. But I think what it is is you have I had a coat yeah, sort of pushing it down. down. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, really, like, I, I could wear, I will wear this all day and yeah. it won't bother me. Do you get um, too warm in it, though? <laughs> I do not. I'm always cold, so. Okay. Um, I'm quite cozy in this. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it, uh, I'm not too warm at all. We we um, have seen, um, you know, we've seen a lot of new people swing by our Facebook group, we're getting a lot of new people that's growing there. And I think yeah. with that, we're getting some uninitiated um I woolly think, lovers. Yeah, people who are new to working with more rustic and woolly wools. Yeah. Um, wool and spun wools, yeah. which are a little different than the worsted spun yeah. wools. Also, this is a, a fairly frequent. We get it in email. We do. Um, we do. You know, you how know, does is, this feel? Is this itchy? Is this itchy? Does it feel like merino? Um, um, nothing. They don't ask if it feels like merino, but I think it's often the, the unimplied, because I think many of us are familiar with yeah. merino. And often, um, I think merino is worsted spun. And then maybe super washed on yeah, top I'm of that. I'm trying to think of if there's a woolen spun merino yarn. And I can't not think sure of about one. that. Mm -mm. Or um, at the most is semi worsted, which is not quite full worsted, but it's not right. woolen either. Yeah. So I think um, merino, we're very used to being soft and sleek and uh, even super wash, which makes it even softer and take color for dye pots yeah. and things really well. Yeah, and some of the super wash, what happened, so I mean, you have merino, which is already, it's a fine wool. If you have your fleece and fiber source book, it's a fine wool, so it's already, that means that each piece of fiber is very thin. Yep. Um, and it's just softer. Yep. Um, and then the super washing process, it, it, you can super wash multiple, different types of ways. Um, they're either putting a coating on it or um, they're pulling the scales off. Like yeah. it's a chemical process that removes the scales. Sounds awful. So because wool has scales, if you look at it under a microscope, sort of like your hair. Sort of like your hair. It, well, it is. It's sort of a follicle, and it yeah. comes out, and it's got these scales on it, which is uh, what gives it that um, ability to felt a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, so the superwash strips off by some chemical method those scales, yeah. so that it's less likely to start. Um, getting what's the word felted yeah I suppose and so that you can throw it in the washing machine which makes it practical but it also strips that wool of any character whatsoever yeah I mean like there's they're, they're still I, fine like I use it for, for I was socks. gonna say there's, there's I hasten to it. say <laughs> that there's definitely a place for superwash 
Um, I use it quite often in my socks because I don't yeah. want to hand wash my socks. I just want to be able to put them in the washing machine. <laughs> I love hand washing my socks. <laughs> That's like a whole thing. <laughs> no. I love hand it's washing my sweaters. No. <laughs> I do. I just enjoy the whole process. Yeah. Um, Tell us your process. <laughs> it's not even a hard process. I like. I just like filling up the big basin with water and putting in my ukulele and just putting all my pretty socks <laughs> in, squishing them down, and yeah. then I just let them sit for a while and I yeah. come back and yeah. um, I do spin them out in the yeah. the washing machine and yeah. then I hang them out to dry and I like them all hung oh, and they look pretty. And yeah. Do you block your socks? I don't block them. I just hang them on. Yeah, I have a you know rack and I yeah. just hang them. Yeah. So uh, my process <laughs> is they go in the washing machine with my other lights, mm -hmm. um, and I scream at everyone that there's you know four pairs of socks in the wash. Don't touch, um, <laughs> because you know it has happened where something's ended up in the yeah. dryer. So no, they know better, and um, and so then I you know they're spun in there, and I uh, hang them up as well. I don't block them. No. Um, I used to have some blockers somewhere. I don't know where they are now. Like, I have some metal blockers, and I'll put them on there. It's mostly I put them on there for photos. or. For exactly. Stuff. I mean, it is nice, though. Yeah. You know, to have a nice... If I'm, if I'm gifting the socks, I'll put them on the blockers when they're slightly damp. Yeah. Like, they don't dry there the whole time. But yeah. then that way they look really nice. That's true. Presented. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But very few people get handmade <laughs> socks as a gift. Your son does. My son does, although he doesn't care if they're blocked. Um, oh, right. I gave my sister a pair for Christmas one year. Um, and then I had a friend I gave, I had two friends I knit socks for one year, so. I used to knit everybody's socks years ago, and they were well received, and my nephew, I think, wore holes in his, mm -hmm. and he wore them so much, but I don't know, I just got out of the way of gift knitting, um, much more into knitting for myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, so, anyway... Yeah, so, so it's not itchy. The, the I think that one of the tricks with the is it itchy question is that it's really personal. It really um, is. For instance, I'm wearing this completely next to skin. I don't yeah. have a sweater on under And this, this is knit with? This is knit with Jameson & Smith uh, Supreme, which is a woolen spun Shetland wool. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's on the softer side of things, but it's woolen spun. Um, but I, it does not bother me at all. And of course, this is Jameson Smith up room in it too, and yeah. that doesn't bother me. And you can wear, similarly, you can wear your vanilla sweaters next to yes. someone, no issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sensitive, I guess. I'm just a rhinoceros of yeah. sorts. And it's funny because um, I've watched Emma of Woolly Mammoth a couple yeah. of times, and she she's knit a couple of Radaris. Yeah. Um, which are knit with Let Lopi. And yeah. she's talked about how she'll wear it just right next to skin. Yeah. She doesn't. So she I said think, it doesn't bother her in the least bit. I think it's smart if you're worried about how a finished object's going to feel that you knit a swatch. Um, Louise of uh, used to be called Knit British, now will work. Okay. Uh, she used to knit a swatch and then put it in a bra strap mm -hmm. and I've just wear it before. next to skin all day. And that is a great way to test a yarn and without making a huge investment right off the I bat. I think what's great about that too is it it allows the, the fabric to sort of wear a mm. little bit. Um, because I think especially with woolen spun yarns, um, you're going to have, because of the nature of how they are prepped, um, you're going to have like little, little pieces or, um, because all the fibers are mixed Pigled together, together, you may have ends that are sticking out on the outside of the yarn, yep. but as you wear it, those, they get just a little bit off. worn, they well, shed and, off, yeah. they, um, just like a worsted spun wool pill. Mm-hmm. Um, a similar process happens and it does it just makes it smoother and better over time which is part of it being a natural product mm -hmm. I mean and to me that's exciting like the, yeah. the character of your finished object will change over time depending on how you wear it and how often you wash it and with that if if you're buying yarns from us it's going to get better with time yeah. it's going to wear well it could become you know heirloom quality you know or you know it is when you finish knitting it because you knit it but yeah. It's something that's going to stand the test of time and it's not going to go out of fashion. It's classic. Um, and the quality of, of the fabric will get better. Yeah. I and think, too, um, I think of yarns like ice creams. Like, I think vanilla is fantastic. And you can put it with all kinds of toppings. Um, yeah. I still knit with merino. I have yeah. it. I love it. Yeah. Um, I'll still spin with it. Um, I prefer it non super wash, but. You so know, I can I think pair, that's a thing. I, but I, I think knowing which wool, like using the right wool with the right project and, and being able to like, when I knit my tree light, I wasn't sure it was my first let Lopi sweater. And I was sort of like, well, 
That's what they said I, to knit it with. That's what they said to knit it with. I was really curious to knit it. Um, since I have started spinning, I really appreciate the just, I just find it really interesting. Like yeah. different breeds and different, they behave differently. They feel differently. Well, and I was thinking about that. So spinners have, a, um, they're ahead of just us knitters. And I talk about myself because it's quite normal in the spinning world to spin a breed specific or blend of yarns and you know what you're doing and you get to know the feel of it and yeah. how they behave in different preps. Whereas I think a lot of knitters don't think about the actual wool. And I think I think of wool like wine. So mm -hmm. with wine, you've you know, a nice bottle of wine is gonna have different grapes from different countries or areas of a country where the environment has an impact on yeah. that and the taste and the the fragrance and all of that stuff. And so when you want to get a nice bottle of wine, you know, you think about that, where do I want it to come from? What do I want it to taste like? Um, and I think yarn is very similar to that. You know, we could all go to Michael's or Joanne's and pick up something that's hugely mass produced. And I don't knock that. I mean, I have knitted with patterns cry for socks and they wear like iron. Yeah. So, I'm not knocking anything and I'm not knocking Merino at all. I just, I guess I have feelings about it. <laughs> but I think, you know, if you think... You passionately love your woolly wool. I really do. <laughs> and if you think about, you know, the woolly thistle and what we try to do here, it's sort of like a nice wine shop if you were buying wine. You'd go yeah. into a nice little wine boutique. You'd talk to people about, well, what about this and what about that? And... Um, it's the same with, I think, wool and yeah. wool. I, I think what we're trying to say is there there is a huge spectrum of yarn and wool, and there's right. so much to learn if you want to. Yes, <laughs> and I think that there's a place for, for all the wools. Yep. Like, there really is. Yeah. Um, I know for me, when I started spinning, I felt like my it just opened up a whole different world. Interesting. Um, because I hadn't really thought about... The breeds and the, the breeds. character. Like, I knew Merino was a specific breed. Um, didn't you try to uh, learn to spin with Merino? I right did learn to that? spin with Merino. That would be hard. Um, <laughs> it was very slippy. I yeah. dropped my drop spindle a lot. <laughs> um, but it was fascinating because immediately when you start spinning, you have a sense for staple length um, and softness in a way that I hadn't before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just got to wondering, like, well, how are the other ones different? And... And then you just realize, like, there's so many breeds out there. Like, I could never in a lifetime spin every no. single breed. And then you can um, blend them. And then you can, yeah, you can either blend them or they can be prepped different ways and then they spin different ways and they behave different ways. Or at the husbandry level, the sheep could be a blend of two different <laughs> yeah. uh, animal, uh, not animals, but breeds. Right. So there is just no end. And I think the book you mentioned, the Fleece and Fiber mm -hmm. um, source book, is fascinating for that if you just want to be, you know, flipping through and looking at different Yeah. Sheep, they give you staple length and micron counts and just where their, you know, where their habitat is. I did bring a little show and tell. I see. Because I got very excited. It's not there. Um, so this is, I'm just going to hold this one. That one's the, mm. that one's your jam. Mm. Um, and then I'll grab the. Smells good. So that is some roving. It is Shetland roving. So it's um, pin drafted roving. So that looks similar. It's not JNS, um, Jameson and Smith roving, but it's similar. It's the same breed. Um, and it's wool. That's a woolen spun prep. And you can see sort of all the fibers in it. And yeah. how they're going all higgledy. -piggledy. They're all higgledy piggledy. Um, I hope you can see that. Yeah. The other thing that's going to happen when you spin this, um, like I drafted it out a little. And as you spin it, you can see all the sort of air that's going to mm. be in there. And so that air, as it spins, gets is trapped. trapped in there. Which, and so you end up with like this squishy, and it insulates. So woolen spun yarns tend to be a little bit warmer. Yeah, and light because you and, get so much air in there. Yes. Let's compare this with your other. So the other one is this stunning. Um, this is Sunflowers in My Garden. It's Corydale. Um, it's from John Arbin, and it is so I would say a this worsted is a, prep. And it's a woolly wool, right? Corydale. Yeah, so I mean, oftentimes when I think of woolly wools, I just think of, of course, sort of non superwash wools as yeah. woolly wools. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Where but this is breed this specific, is. so it's Corydale. But these are breed specific. This one's Corydale. <laughs> this looks more like hair in the sense that. Yeah, and he has some fantastic videos on his YouTube channel yeah. showing you exactly how all these are kept in line. So hold it right up so that people can see. Look at that, and then maybe we can compare. Yeah. 
So, so um, the finished yarns are just going to feel dramatically different because this one ha is going to have a nice smooth outside, and this one is just going to um, it's going to be fullier, fluffy. like fluffier, yeah. and you can see some of these little ends that that Corrine would not notice at all. You might <laughs> wearing them. Somebody you, else, if you're really sensitive, they might. But, but this, also, as you wear this, some of those ends they're just either going to be smoothed down or they're going to fall out if they're little tiny ends. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas this feels more heavy because everything is in alignment, so there's more wool per inch than there yeah. is in here. And oftentimes, worsted spun yarns they're more dense. Mm -hmm. They feel more dense. They're a little heavier. Do they have better drape? They can. They can, but I think two gauge factors in there. You yep. can change gauge with yep. needles. Yep. Um, this is where I get really excited because the, the variables, it's like you can play with all the different variables. Like even your the vanilla sweater, that's not knit at the recommended gauge no. for Rama Fennel Garden. Right. That's how you get that That's drape. right. That's right because it's a woolen spun yeah. and it's drapey. Whereas I did knit a Devonia sweater, um, and it's very drapey. I mean, Devonia, but I also knit it on, what was it, size four, six needles? Mm. So it, it is. It's a nice drapey yeah. open fabric. Yeah. Um, it's still a rather dense yarn, and that sweater's not nearly as warm right. as a vanilla sweater would be. But yes, I mean, yeah, I think there's lots of beautiful Shetland shawls that are woolen prepped. And they don't have to be worsted spun to be drapey. That's true. That's true. I think yeah. a lot of it's to do a gauge and then what you do with it. But th yeah. this is like Goldilocks's hair right here. Yeah. And and both Feels are beautiful. Lovely. And I think that um very like I, silky. I did finally finish spinning. I think I actually left it in the bath at home. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get that. But um they're really pretty. And when you're spinning, you can change things a little bit. Like you can you could make this, you could turn this into like Rolex and make, yeah. make it a semi woolen spun. Yeah. Um, because there you're sort of. And then you would add more air into it mm -hmm. or even just the way that you're drafting, like the, the hand spun that I showed from this, I added a bunch of sort of, I was very light handed and it's just a fluffy yarn. Well, Marie right Wallen's up. yarn is worsted spun, but it has the look and feel, I think, of a woolen spun. It does. I think that has to do with that steaming that she said happens. Of the finishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll but see. also it's got a it's got a loose ply too. It's not, you know, it's not tight. It's yeah. not, it, it's allowed to be a little bit loose, I think. It is. But it it's, is. It's so, got that woolen so feel So yeah, you me. can change things too with yeah. like, um, I always think when I get questions about the is it itchy I have a merino hat that I bought from an indie dyer um beautiful yarn it is it is the only hat that really itches my forehead huh. and it shouldn't it's merino yeah. right you wouldn't think but I think the yarn itself is like the base that she dyed on has a lot of twist it is a very high twist yarn and that is and what that is what it just like, that's oh, so after interesting a while, it's the twist that it's just on my forehead so i had knitted a cardigan and the the uh, neck band i think i i was too tight with i didn't have enough stitches going around mm -hmm. the back and so it became very tight and when i wore it i was just like god this is uncomfortable it's itchy and oh i'm not used to this yeah and i took the the band off and i put more stitches in and let it all relax doesn't bother me at yeah. all. So I think, yes, I mean, there's all kinds of things that go into whether it's itchy or, you know, yeah. nice feeling. But I think the point is, for me, is that this is an exploration and mm -hmm. there, there's no right or wrong. Not There's no right or wrong at all. I think yeah. it's, all, it's all learning. If you want to learn it, it's really fun. Yeah, and I think being willing, like, if you wanted to try, if you're worried that Let Lopi is too rustic, like, I don't know, I haven't yet tried Let Lopi or Plodo Lopi in a hat. Mm. Um, I I'm have. Just, I'm just not sure how it would wear for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, I mean, it does feel pretty rustic. Yeah. But I can get my kids to wear this even. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, I can feel that, right. but it's not... But I think even then, if I really want one, I would just probably have like mohair at the ready to knit a band on the inside, oh, pretty. or something yeah. else to, as yeah. a way to sort of mitigate. Right. Um, so yeah, there's endless, endless opportunities, and it's sort yeah. of like problem solving and getting creative. You know, if you're particularly sensitive to something. Yeah. Um, but it's fun trying to find out for sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, welcome to the show. <laughs> things I really oh, enjoy talking about. Yeah, but I me think too. especially it's why one of those like when we get the 
be as a itchy question question it's just hard well because some of it's so personal and first of all no shade i mean right. no, you know, it's so, fine to ask that definitely absolutely. yeah absolutely like it's a common question i think yeah. it's a valid question yeah. um it's it can just be hard to answer because it is so personal and, yeah and so sometimes i'll try to ask like well what yarns do you use that you really like um, and if the only yarn that you can possibly wear is something that's merino, then at least I know where we're starting from. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have things that on that side of the, what, what do we have that would be good? We've got Black Horse Swan, which is a uh, Shetland merino blend. We have now um, Oyster and Pearls, and there's mm -hmm. a Romney merino blend there. Yep. These are really nice as blends because you're getting a little bit of rustic and you're getting a little bit of your comfort yep. uh, zone. And it's almost a stepping stone to yeah. other and then I usually, I find I'll ask, you know, can you wear Jameson and Smith? Because if you can wear that, most likely you'll be okay with Roma Fennel Barn. Mm -hmm. um, you Although I've heard it, somebody called it a Brillo pad. I know. It Not just, cool. Made you sad. <laughs> <laughs> it did make me sad. Um, I think that was an exaggeration yeah. for sure. I mean, I think so. And I think the way that it feels in the skein um, feels different to me after yep. it's washed. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, but you know, you're going to knit with it before, well, I mean, you could wash it before you knit with it, of course, but nobody does that. So, you know, knitting right. with it is going to be one experience, but then blocking it and giving it a soak will result in a different fabric. Yeah. Blocking is magic. Blocking is mm. magic. All right. Um, so. Uh, so, yes, so. I'm, I'm wearing the uh, Silver Forest by Jennifer Steingass. In, um, I knitted mine in Jameson and Smith. Uh, supreme and we have kits for this except we're out of this dark brown black mm -hmm. color right now so when that comes in we'll put that in and then of course this is my fuller snood which is probably my most worn item that i've ever knitted donna smith and shetland designed this mm -hmm. um it's absolutely lovely uh knitted in jameson smith two ply and i think we have kits we for do. this okay yep. good yeah so i i love wearing this all the time um do you have any whips to show? I do have, I have one whip. I didn't, I've been just like finishing little things. Yeah. But um, I cast on, um, oh, I didn't grab a skein um, of Oyster and Pearls. Ooh. Um, I do not remember what color this was. So I cast on, it is Oyster and Pearls. I cast on a hat. Oh, it's lovely. And it is, it feels pretty nice. Yes, it does. See, it does feel soft. It does, it feels <laughs> soft. It's the, you've got that soft bounce. It's lovely. Um, it is, it's really nice. Yeah, and it also feels sturdy. It does. I think that's partly the Romney. Like as yep. I've been, um, what a nice it is. So combination. I think it's gonna be nice. I, I was sitting there the other night and I put just this on my head. <laughs> as you do. My husband was looking at me. He's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm just testing it." Just, what do you think? It's quite comfy. What do you think? It's I. It's I think it'll be fine. It's a cute, cute hat. What yeah. design are you knitting? So I'm knitting a design out of oh this book the. Maragon. Maragon's Twisted Stitch Source Book. So did you take a stitch out of here and you're just making your own hat? Um, no, there's like a hat pattern. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. So I just um, cast on the hat pattern. I. But this I'm, is a stitch dictionary of sorts, right? It is a stitch dictionary. And then at the back of the book, she has a number of patterns to get you started. I was just fascinated. I don't love cables yet. Why not? I don't know they seem fiddly and I don't want another mm. yarn and I'm always or another needle and I can do it without the needle I don't know you know how some things just light you up and other things don't yeah I just I don't it's know why it just thing. doesn't mm -hmm. I love the look of it mm -hmm. which is why I'm glad my sister really likes to knit cables so if I really want something with cables I'm just like hey oh I'm, I'm jealous <laughs> you've, you've got a knitter in waiting yes. <laughs> I mean I may have to wait quite a bit but yeah um, sorry, what do you knit for her what do you do that she doesn't care for? Anything? Make requests. Ah. <laughs> I don't know. I, like, I'll spin for her. Oh, nice. Um, she's not a big shawl knitter, so I have her. <laughs> I did knit her a shawl. Nice. Yeah. She knit us a shawl. I didn't know that she wasn't a shawl knitter. I did. Her. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> Sisters. So I'm knitting this hat. It's it pretty. Is the, it just says hat and knits. So... But I really like it. I like all the texture and um, yeah, this book just kind we of got blew a, me away. We got a few of these books in. Um, so yeah, it's mostly a stitch dictionary. I love stitch dictionaries. It though. just makes me want to swatch everything. Mm -hmm. Play with. And so being a twisted stitch, it's sort of like baby cables and you can do that without a cable needle. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, she explains it all in the book. It's fascinating. Mm. Um, and yeah. I, I like really, that. I like that backstory. Yeah. Um, yeah. I so, so I've just been knitting on this hat. So pretty. It makes me think of, um, caramel gelato or something. Is that yeah. kind of color? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Okay, so, so we did sew it of, uh, all of it except for we had a lot of green yeah um, so we still have some of that left but everything else went but we'll we'll talk to bat and kill about getting some more yeah yeah I'm I think enjoying you guys it liked it. it it's good yeah and we like them um, their their buzzwords their tagline is sustainable traceable and responsible so yeah. uh, we really love that about mm -hmm. that line and we're happy to have it here yeah um, I have some knits too to show um, this is an FO, except I have still to um, do what I always save to the end, of course, which is weaving in ends and doing the holes under the underarm. This is for my daughter, and it's a vanilla sweater, of course. I did lengthen the sleeves so that they're full length, and I just did a one-by-one one rib on the end. It's so pretty. It's, it's lovely. And I did the... Um, the fancy little mohair neckline on it although I think I am going to take this out and just do a one by one ribbon because she has a lot of hair and to get her head through this Aww. when you when you do this you are tacking down the end so it uh -huh. gives it less stretch <clears throat> yep. the hole is definitely big enough but we just need a bit more stretch so I think I'll put a one by one rib there um but this is knitted with of course Roma Fennel Garn and a strand of their plum mohair and it's really nice and fluffy so um, I'm gonna put a little video in here of her wearing it so you can see the FO and uh, while we're chit-chatting I love that she's wearing wool me too I it was hard it. one <laughs> <laughs> and so that's one that's another reason that I want to do the one by one rib around the next so that it's not hard for her to get on enough there's no barriers to her wearing it or excuses to not wearing it <laughs> So yeah, this is um, the vanilla fluff. And of course, mine here too. Um, they've both been blocked. Mama and mama and daughters. Aww. Yeah, so very happy with those. Ready to start a new project, I think. Um, okay, so that's it. I've shown you what I'm knitting. You've shown us what you're knitting. Yeah. Do you want to show, do you want to say thank you for the little <gasps> gift you got? I do, I do. Something happened so, here. <laughs> Something happened. Um, uh, Josh came by uh, with a mail delivery, and um, one of our lovely viewers, uh, Susan, um, <laughs> sent me a little elf. It's so, so adorable. She knit it with Let Lopey. Mm -hmm. um, I think the pattern is from Church Mouse Yarns. Oh, I love that he's got is, a little knot. It does. It's so adorable. And he's got like little hands here. <laughs> So, Very cute. So adorable. He's been living on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, I need to bring him home because I've told the kids um, that somebody did that. And they, they, they're like, they did what? <laughs> I'm like, I know. <laughs> Knitters are awesome. Somebody knit for me. So I thought that was really nice. So I've already emailed her. Thank you. But thank you so much. I just had to show her everybody because it's yeah. so adorable. She knit it with Let Lopey. Um, it's really great. Adorable. And I just love that these things knit up. Quite quickly although mm -hmm. it's a small circumference which sort of makes it go I don't know but yeah it's he's so pretty or she <laughs> yeah I love their scarf I love it garden it so scarf. much yeah so and they sent a cute little oh so thank you so to Susan nice. for my little elf I love yeah. it it's been sitting on my desk I love well it. I think your big elf has been getting some love my, uh, my big comments gnome. yeah, yeah. Uh, no that's right yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I do think I'm going to try and knit in them a month, so. <laughs> bring them in. Keep I, us, will, I will bring them we'll in. All, we'll all start knitting them with our scraps, you know? I, I mean, know. that is a good way to, to I keep. I think, too, what, what I like is, um, and I don't know if I said this last time, because I, I did get a question about it. So, all I did to make the bigger gnome was I used bigger needles and bigger yarn, and yeah. I followed the pattern exactly as it was written. That's the beauty of and it. And just ended up with a bigger gnome. Yeah, so just match the gauge <coughs> of, of all the yarns you're using in it, Yeah, you know? And or double up. Although even that with a gnome, you got a little wiggle room. Yeah, it probably makes him even more interesting, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, okay, so um, we have a cal coming up. We do. Now, when does this go out? <clears throat> this goes out on like the eleventh. Yep. So next week we start the cal. Is that is that right? Yeah. And we're gonna do a live in the Facebook group. 
Yeah, that's set. We're doing that at one o'clock on Friday the 18th, one o'clock Eastern time. So join us in the Facebook group for that mm -hmm. live cast on, at which point I hopefully have decided <coughs> what the heck I'm knitting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And certainly if that time doesn't, you can cast on any time on the 18th. And you know, if the 18th is just a busy day for you, cast on on the 19th. <laughs> yeah, cast on the um, weekend. You can cast on. We just don't want you really starting before that. But yeah, um, yeah, you can join us at 1 o'clock if you can't make it for 1 o'clock. Or if you can't cast on at 1 o'clock, well, that's totally okay. And I think it records so you can watch it yeah. later too and just, you know, watch me blather. Blather, blather. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, we do have this cow coming. I think we're going to have a lot of participation is the sense mm -hmm. I'm getting, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. And yes. you can either join us in the Facebook or the, the live will be in the Facebook group. Um, we also have a chat thread going in our Ravelry group. Yes. Um, I see some people in both, which is always really fun. Those of you who have cowed with us before will maybe know about the prize fairy. Um, I think the prize fairy will be popping in in all the places Excuse from time to time, which is uh, fun and just do you want to explain do. what the price fairy does? Um, well, I don't want to pin her down because she's a fairy, but um, she tends to visit people in the groups and uh, drop little fairy dust of prizes and things, just little things throughout. So, you know, help you stay motivated, keep knitting. Of course, this is just an accessory cow, so we don't need to um, need that much motivation, but because um, I'll be done before you know it. But it's fun to have the price fairy sort of it stop is. in and sprinkle some happy. <laughs> happy uh, knitting dust around the place. So when you sign up for a cow, this is the first time we've ever done this too. Lots of changes this year, but you know, why not? You know, like we're, we're experimenting. So this year we're asking that you sign up for the cow, which you can do right on the shop website. Um, and all you need to do is give us your email address and you're in, and we will email you a copy of my pattern here called the Belvoni bonnet. And um, it's cute. <laughs> I like it. This, this I actually was able to do fairly quickly as, in terms of designing it. it when, once it got going, once I figured out how to do this, I was off. Took me a wee while to figure that out, but once I, once I started seeing it, it came together really quickly. Anyway, um, so we will email you this. This is knitted in Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight. My hair is getting really <laughs> staticky. Like, oh, yeah, no, I can oh. see it like going, <laughs> floating up a little. My mustache. <laughs> um, but you can knit this in any fingering weight yarn, I would say, for sure. Um, I think we are putting together a little yarn set though. Yep. So all it is is three three balls of yarn, two of the gray or whatever um, main color and one of the contrast color. Um, but I think we'll make up little yarn sets with this and you'll probably get a nice little tote bag thrown yep. in. Why not? But yeah, we have so many. I think we just um, got yarn in. We got lots of Jameson and Smith in that we were waiting for. So the Boo Ness should be in when you see this. That's by MJ Mucklestone and it's yeah. in her book, uh, Fair Out Weekend. The minute I saw this, I fell in love with I really it. I like it. Mm -hmm. It's super pink. Super <laughs> pink. Um, we showed some of these last time, but it doesn't hurt to show yeah. them again. <clears throat> this is uh, Ella Gordon's Croft Hoos. We couldn't remember the name of this last mm -hmm. time. Um, and this was her patron uh, for her her when she was patron of Shetland Mill Week. Yep. This was her design and you can see the wee croft hooses there which is super cute. Yep. And this is the Busta Beanie, also knit in Jameson and Smith. Which this was also a Shetland Wool Week. Yeah, so um, that was Gudrun Johnson's. Yeah. Um, that is such a classic one. I mean, <laughs> boy, girl, you know, anybody. Um, yeah. Any colors you like and it really is and there's no catching of floats needed. It's a very potato chippy knit too. Because mm -hmm. you're yeah. like, ooh, I'm just going to do one more section. One more round, one more section, yeah. And then yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. So, and I really like the crown of this one. I don't know if we showed it before. But it all just feeds into that yeah, central. Yeah, like a little starburst almost. Yeah. It's pretty. Oh, and we just, this here, the two color tapestry cowl is now an individual PDF on the shop. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people buying it, which yeah. is like, oh, that's great. Yeah, so there's that. There, we still have the kits for, for the original, yeah. for the original uh, seven color one. Um, one time, Maggie and I decided that we would try and put together some other colors uh, for a seven cow kit. It is not easy. I It was not. It was surprisingly I, difficult. Like, it was. I didn't think it would be quite as difficult as it was. So I think I, I nailed it with this one, but I don't <laughs> think I can replicate it. So um, this is the kit, is you get these colors. You know what I think would look really cool? If somebody did like a rainbow version. Oh, like yeah. even if you just kept the oh the, the seven motif. colors of the rainbow yeah I think you could just keep like the you motif could. like white but then go through and the then rainbow go through the rainbow mm. I think that that 
that would be really that great. would be nice yeah um, but that would be super nice yes and then you would keep the motif the same perhaps yeah. all the way through so lots and lots I'm of tempted in the tapestry color are you yeah. are you i don't well, know that i would do the original i would probably yeah, do a two but color you could, <clears throat> you could do it you could just do one around or you could do two around i'd probably do two I, I love the two around that that's what this is too yeah. and it's just very very wearable yep. in all weathers <gasps> I know. Well, I know. I'm not going to commit you to knitting that, but that's exciting. No, that's what I've been leaning towards. Yeah. Because I'm really into, this year I'm just wearing cowls all the time. What colors? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. And now. We'll have to tune always, in to see. And then working here, it's always. Um, <laughs> Spoiled for do choice. Do I use stash or do I <laughs> go shopping? And I'm always like, shopping. I'm just going knit from stash. And then I end up shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm like, ooh, this will look pretty. This yeah. will look pretty. Yeah. I know. There's so much inspiration out there. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, so the cow is coming. It's, it starts on February 18th. It's a month long, so yep. four weeks. And Ravelry uh, thread, we will be chatting in there as well as the Facebook group. So one or both or whatever your fancy is, we'll yep. see you there. And there will be prize in both places, mm -hmm. prizes in both places. Correct. And the accessories list includes hats, um, hats, cowls, socks, scarves, mittens, gloves so anything accessories that is all over color work that's mm -hmm. what we're going for yep and you can knit um it can be stranded color work it can be mosaic knitting it can be um what did we say intarsia um somebody asked about two color brioche oh and yeah yes yeah why not why not you work in um, yes um color work crochet yep um yeah crochet um didn't yeah. i just see a I'm getting more people asking about crochet, and crocheters are absolutely welcome. Yes. Um, there are some amazing designs out there. Help us help you, too, um, yeah. because if there's a particular woolly wool that you like for crocheting with, tell us. Uh, we will we will do our best to get it in for you. Happy to do that. Yeah. So we have Rachel with us again this week, and uh, she is actually uh, taking some of your questions that you've been asking in the comments, and she's taking some time to answer them. So... Uh, listen up and enjoy. Uh, we love Rachel and all that she does, and we're really grateful that she contributes to the Shopcast. So go watch her, then come back. We'll have some more stuff to show you, and we even have a very special, different segment that we think you're going to love as well. So we'll see I, you. I will. Sorry, I want to say for any new viewers who might be here, Rachel um, is a crofter who lives on the Isle of Bear Isle in Shetland. And, in Shetland, and she sends uh, contribution videos to our shopcast, yeah. and they are amazing. And They're wonderful. postcards. They're postcards from Shetland, and I just keep thinking that we're all old friends here, and I don't have to introduce anyone. So thank but you. We keep picking up new friends, which is really, really great. <laughs> yep. Um, and if you like this, you'll definitely want to go back and watch Rachel's yes um, previous uh, segments. Exactly. So um, she pretty much contributes once a month, and um, I know Rachel. Rachel from when my mum lived on Feral, they were neighbours, and so it's really great to have her um, keeping the connection with Feral and the Woolly Thistle going here. So without further ado, let's go to Rachel and we'll see you back here after. Hi Woolly Thistlers, it's Rachel from Barkland Croft here in Fair Isle, and uh, it's lovely to be back with you again. Thank you so much for all your comments on my previous postcard from Fair Isle in the Woolly Thistle video. Uh, and I really appreciated all the questions that you asked me. So uh, that's what we're going to do in today's episode. I'll uh, try and work my way through and answer those questions for you. Uh, but first of all, we're in February. Where did January go? How did it go so quickly? Um, already feels like the year is getting away with me. I don't know about you. So for the first question, I had four people who asked uh, fairly similar questions. Um, and let's, uh, let's work through those. So uh, multi-knitter Nancy Knott asked, how many sheep do you have? How difficult do you find it being a shepherdess? Do you ever have to bring in help at certain times? And if so, what might those times be? Uh, then Joanne, Lager or Lager asked, what's it like farming in the winter when the nights are so long and the days are short? Mcrot1 or Mkrot1 said, I'd really like to know more about your sheep, your care for them, what feeds you feed them. I'm all about what goes into the sheep to produce such lovely yarn in the end. 
and Cindy Lee asked, I noticed in the video of your sheep at the end uh, of my last video that it was very cold, windy and very wet where they were at. Do they have a warm place to be at night and does the ground cause problems for them in the winter with it being cold and wet? Do you have to do anything to protect them? Well, to start off, a little bit about my sheep for those of you that, that don't already know. I currently have about 80 sheep in total, which is the maximum amount that I can keep um, on the amount of land that I have here in Fair Isle. And of those 80, about three quarters of them are pure Shetlands. Um, so I'll put up a picture here of um, Piccalilly and Agatha. And then I've got about 20 who are uh, Shetland Texel crosses, um, or maybe three quarter Texel, like uh, Shauna in the picture, and uh, Wellington, who's the bigger one, uh, watching Biscuit being clipped. And then I've got one Suffolk um, called Patchwork. Well, the main thing they get fed, in addition to their hay and silage, is this, uh, which is, I think it's just called booster nuts. Um, it's basically a barley blend um, with some added extras in. And then I mix in with that some of this, which is um, shredded beet. Um, and that's just quite sort of tasty for them. And then some of them, if they're needing a little bit extra or they're needing encouraging to eat, um, this is a, a coarse mix. Um, I think they call it crunch. Um, looks a bit like rabbit food. Um, and that's just a really kind of tasty extra treat that will encourage them to eat full of lots of yummy things. So that's the three main hard feeds that they get um, and then they also get either hay or silage um, and they get uh, where are they? these mineral lick tubs um, which I put out and they can access as and when they, they want uh, just to help boost their nutrients. I've got some hungry ones in here, they've heard me rattling the feed. Are you ready for breakfast? You're always ready for breakfast, big girl. That's <laughs> why you're the size you are. So this is the uh, the forage that the sheep get fed. Um, this is what's called silage here on Fair Isle, um, but is more probably known as haylage everywhere else. And that's what we make ourselves. You know, we grow the grass in the summer and it gets cut and dried a little bit and then baled and wrapped. So these are the boys and as you can see, <laughs> their fields are really exposed and there's no natural shelter for them. they can come in and take shelter with the hens and then they also have bits around here where they can shelter as well depending on what direction the, the wind's coming from so little bits in there little sections on here as you can see from all the, the poop on here, they like to, uh, they actually go up on here, some of them, uh, to, to sleep because you, you can tell by the lack of the wind now, it's a really, really sheltered spot <laughs> up there. Hi Conker! Hi Fuzzy Felt! Hey Conker! 
so these are the yaws um, and as you can see again they've got quite an exposed area in which they live there's no barn or anything for them um, however they do have quite a few uh, little bits which are quite enclosed that they can come into and sort of huddle in together for warmth. And dotted around there's also uh, two or three of these field shelters um, which are sort of panels put up in a, a cross shape so that they can be sheltered from any direction of wind. And there's also a few stone uh, ruins and old stone shelters as well in the field. So they've got plenty of places they can go um, to get shelter from the weather conditions. Then the, uh, the last batch of sheep are these guys. These are the gimmers, which are last year's female lambs and also a couple of my sort of special needs ones. A scampy cat in the background. Um, so these guys are just having their breakfast at the moment. They're in what used to be the, uh, the garage. <laughs> There's Blossom with her wonky legs and wonky jaw and yeah, bits of everything in here, um, hay, feed, storage, straw. So these guys have free access into there, they can come and go as they want. Um, then they've got this which is kind of the back garden and then the other side of those buildings which is the side garden so they've got plenty of bits to uh, to run around in as well so the weather here in fair isle can be pretty horrid and uh, winter is especially so uh, seeing as it feels like it lasts for about six months of the year uh, we get very, very strong winds here in Fair Isle throughout the winter, well, autumn, winter, spring. Um, so today, although it, uh, you can see by the reflection in my glasses that it's quite sunny outside, um, we've got winds over 60 miles an hour today um, and they're forecast for the next few days to continue like that. And also we had hailstorms this morning while I was out feeding them. Uh, so throughout the winter the ground gets very very boggy very muddy and it doesn't really get chance to dry out at all so one of the problems that can cause for the sheep is with their feet and they can get something called foot rot um, and the way we kind of prevent that or take care of that is if I see a, a sheep that's limping uh, the first thing we'll do is give their foot uh, a clean clean out any any mud that's in there and give it what we call blue spray which is um, a spray that we get from the vets it's called teramycin um, and that's uh, kind of like an antibiotic spray so that will hopefully kill um, any nastiness that's that's got inside their feet if that doesn't work um, then we'll probably inject them uh, with something like alamycin which again will help combat uh, the spread of any any nastiness the start of any any infection there uh, so foot care is quite a big one through the winter, just keeping an eye on their, their feet um, and nipping any, any sort of lameness in the bud. One of the other things I do in terms of caring for the sheep is that at specific times of the year I will dose them. Um, and that's essentially giving them a, an oral medicine which will prevent things like liver fluke and worms which can be very harmful to them internally. And uh, I'll put a little video of me doing that for the boys, which I did. I was doing last week, and um, it can be a bit tricky to do single-handedly because you've got to hold the sheep, administer the dose, um, and then try and mark them as well, so you know which ones you've done. So um, that's why I'm holding the, the marker crayon <laughs> in my mouth. Farming through the winter, um, I'm not going to lie, it, uh, it can be pretty horrid and there are days when I absolutely hate it. I don't hate the fact that I have to do it, it's just I hate the weather, I hate wading through six inches of mud, I hate that the sheep are having to stand in mud. 
um, that there's there's nowhere kind of dry for them to go. Um, it, it can be really, really challenging, um, especially when you're you're trying to push bales of silage through inches of mud when you've got storm force winds blowing against you. Um, so yeah, it's it's challenging. It's I wouldn't say it's it's nice <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and yeah, you, you do spend many months longing for, you know, the, the nice uh, weather of summer and for wanting the, the ground to, to dry up and get solid again. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably the weather is definitely the biggest challenge of farming, crofting throughout the, the winter. Um, how difficult do I find it being a shepherdess? Um, I don't know that it's difficult. I, w I wouldn't say it's difficult. Um, obviously, it's challenging at times. Doing, I live on my own, so I do everything by by myself. Um, it's more kind of from a, a time constraint point of view. The length of time it takes me to do things with the sheep then impacts on how much time I have to do things like earn money <laughs> through working. Um, so it can be difficult in that respect, just trying to juggle everything. And obviously with the long nights and the short days throughout the winter uh, weeks and months, um, that can have a, a big impact. So for instance, today, it's normally at the moment, so we're beginning of February, it's, it's light enough to go out and, and do feeding around about quarter to eight in the morning. Um, I think this morning, by the time I'd finished doing the dogs and the cats, it was about eight o'clock by the time I went out to do the sheep. Um, and I got back inside just before 11 o'clock this morning. So it took me nearly three hours. Um, a lot of that was because of the, the weather conditions and battling against those. Um, but yeah, three hours and that's just to feed three lots of sheep with hard feed and then roll out bales of silage, that kind of thing. So then that means by the time I've come inside, got showered and changed, ready to actually start my working day, it's getting on for midday and then it's dark again by the time it's sort of half past four. So that window of opportunity to get things done can be really narrow. Um, so some days if we do get a, a decent day of weather, I need to spend the whole day outside kind of catching up on, on jobs that, that need doing outside, like repairing fencing, ditching, if I need to move sheep, that, that sort of thing. Do I ever bring help in? Um, the only times really that I would, I need to sort of ask for help is during lambing. Um, if I'm not able to lamb a yow myself, if there's some complications going on, or if I'm not confident enough that I can do it myself, um, then I'll phone my neighbour Ian um, and, and he'll come down and help me. But other than that, I, I do everything myself. Um, Apart from things like bailing um, in the summer months where as an island community we kind of, we're, we're very limited by the machinery we have. We only have a couple of tractors, there's only one bailing machine, there's only one waffler machine which turns the, the hay over. Um, so then we go around the aisle working from croft to croft um, as a big sort of team getting the bailing done uh, around the field. So that that's, I guess that's bringing help in, in in one respect. The next question um, is from two people that had similar questions. Uh, Delma Hockett um, asked, how cold does it get in winter? And uh, do I sell the wool from my sheep? Uh, they also wanted to know, do I get to keep the uh, the coat I designed for the, the Barber Bow competition? I'm not sure about that yet. We'll have to, to wait and see. Um, and also uh, a similar question to that was, um, I think it's Esther Rubin, trying to read my writing, um, who said, what does she do with the wool from her sheep? So first part of Delma's question, uh, how cold does it get in winter? Because we're such a small island surrounded by sea for many miles in, in all directions, it's a very kind of maritime climate. I know that sounds a, an obvious thing to say, but the impact that has on us um, is, is that we have a very, very narrow temperature range. So it never gets very cold here. It never gets very hot here. Um, saying that obviously the wind chill factor plays a big part. So it often feels very, very much colder than it actually is, if that makes sense. Um, so winter temperatures 
it rarely gets below zero, uh, that's degrees C uh, freezing. Um, it will occasionally go maybe down to at minus two, minus three is about the absolute kind of coldest it would be, that, again, degrees C, degrees centigrade. Um, and then in summer, it very, very rarely gets above 15 degrees C, probably 17 degrees C here is, is the hottest, I think it's been in the seven years that I've been here. Um, and it really does feel like a, an absolute heat wave then. As for uh, what I do with the, the wool from my sheep, so the fleeces from my Pure Shetlands um, go out every two years uh, to Uist Wool over on the Isle of North Uist in uh, the, the Western Isles, the Outer Hebrides. And this year was the first year that I actually uh, got my skeins of wool back. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see those. So there's the, they're all natural shades. I don't have any dyed skeins. Um, this one is the, the natural white colour, which is kind of a, a creamy off-white. And this is called Beecroft Busby. Then I have a, a pale Moorit colour, which is Beecroft Butterscotch. And finally a grey, I'd probably call that a, a mid to dark grey, uh, which is the Beecroft Barnacle. And those skeins are for sale, they're 100 gram skeins of uh, DK weight yarn and uh, they're for sale in my online shop which is www.b-croft.co.uk and I'll, I'll pop the address just here for you if you want to have a look. My next question is from Eugene Diocno, uh, apologies if I've pronounced that incorrectly, and they asked um, about the rainbow sheep sweater, um, whether there was a pattern and what yarn I used for it. Um, so for those of you who, who haven't seen it, um, this is what I call my, my rainbow sheep jumper or sweater. Um, and it's quite a sort of a, a boxy design, three quarter length sleeve. Um, and it has these fun, little sheepy buttons on it. Um, this was one that I designed uh, last year and it's, I haven't written a pattern for it. It's, it's not, um, not at the moment uh, available as a, a hand knitting pattern, um, but I will be selling the actual garments, the finished garments in my online shop. Um, but again, it's, it's finding the time to get around to actually doing that and knitting up prototypes in each, uh, each, each size, but it will get there eventually and I, I will be updating my shop uh, just as soon as I've got that done. So it's not knitted in my own wool from my own sheep, um, but it is knitted with pure Shetland wool uh, from Jameson's of Shetland. Uh, and it's in all these lovely kind of dual rainbow tones. My next question is from Linda Lepek. Um, and she has a question that a lot of people ask uh, when they see pictures of Shetland and Fair Isle. And she says, there's a lack of trees in Shetland. Is that because of the wind? Um, and that's a really good question. Uh, going back thousands of years, Shetland used to be covered in, in vast forests of, of trees. Um, although nowadays there are only a few areas where you will see trees growing. Um, certainly on Fair Isle, we have hardly any trees at all. And the, the very, very few that we do have um, are very, very small examples. Um, but I'll, I'll put a couple of examples in the photos here for you. The first two photos are of what's called plantation, uh, which is at the very end of a kind of winding gully. So it's protected on pretty much uh, three sides. And then this second photo shows the solitary pine tree that grows in gully, which is a, a very sheltered location. And the reason, certainly on Fair Isle, that, that trees don't go is again, because we we have such a, a kind of a, a maritime climate. So it's very wet, it's very salty from the sea. Um, so things growing get a lot of salt burn, um, which just kills them right off. Um, so things will grow, trees will grow, 
but they have to be protected on all sides. Um, so it kind of the, the as tall as they get is limited by how much protection you can give them, uh, which is why we have very few sort of bushes or trees naturally growing here on the aisle. And my final questions come from Rebecca Bandy, who asked, what made you choose Fair Isle as your home? And what is your knitting history? And Alicia Liang, uh, who asked, I'm curious how long she's been a crofter and how she came into her particular craft. So I first came to Fair Isle in 2014 uh, when I came to work for a season at the Fair Isle Bird Observatory as assistant cook. Um, and then moved here permanently the following year, so 2015. And the way that came about was while I worked at the, the OBS, the cook at the time, she and her family lived in this house that I now live in and they were leaving Fair Isle. And on my days off, I'd kind of go around the aisle and, you know, go walking and help out if anyone needed hand with stuff. And as time went on, people started asking, you know, have you thought about applying for, for Barkland? Have you thought about, you know, taking the croft on? And first off, I kind of thought, oh gosh, you know, couldn't do that. I've no experience of sheep. I've never, you know, done anything remo remotely related to crofting. Um, but then the more I kind of spoke to people about it and people assured me that, you know, it's doable, you can learn. Most people moving to Farrell nowadays don't have any experience with sheep or crofting so uh, yeah so that that's how that came up it was really uh, an opportunity came up at the right time and and I took it as for my knitting history um, I I knew how I, I can't remember where or when I learned to knit or who taught me and that's not because oh I've been knitting since I was a baby it's nothing like that it's simply I honestly can't remember learning um, I don't know whether it was maybe at school or my mum or gran taught me I, I just don't remember um, so when I came to Fair Isle I could knit um, in that I could cast on I could knit I could purl I could cast off that was kind of about it but I wasn't I wouldn't have ever said I was a knitter um, I had an interest in knitting an interest in in textiles, in natural fibres like the wool, um, but I wouldn't have said I, I was an active knitter, certainly. Um, then being on Fair Isle, obviously it's, you see all the knitwear around you, and so I started doing a little bit of hand knitting. I, I made a few caps um, for friends and family. Um, and then when I moved here permanently, I got trained as a finisher for two of the knitwear companies on the aisle. Um, and a finisher is someone who essentially pieces together the, gar the, the different parts of a garment. So when garments are knitted, say a jumper, you would knit a front, a back and two sleeves and then the ribs for the bottom, the wrists and the neck. And then it's the finisher's job to seam and graft all of those together. So you come up with the finished item. Um, and then for accessories, so, so things like... Um, scarves you would do the big seam hats you would hand knit the the crown of the hats um, and seam them together um, so that, that's the job of a, a finisher so I did that for two years and then I got trained to use the knitting machine um, so ever since then I've been doing both knitting and and finishing um, and probably about two to three years ago um, I started getting more involved with my hand knitting um, started trying out different patterns um, I always kind of tried to play it safe I think by choosing things that I knew I could knit that weren't too adventurous um, but then I think with that you, you can maybe get stuck in a rut um, so one of the things I did was I started signing up as a test knitter for a couple of knitting publications like um, Making Stories magazine um, I think for most of those episodes uh, issues um, I've done test knits on socks um, I've never done a test knit for anything like a, a jumper or cardigan or sort of a, a garment uh, purely because I am a slow hand knitter um, and I would be worried that I wouldn't be able to finish the test knit in the time that you're, you're given just because of other commitments here on the craft and with my own work um, but things like socks are quite doable um, and I think doing test knits it pushes you a little bit to try different things that you might not normally 
choose to knit for yourself. So certainly I feel that I've, I've grown as a, a knitter over the last two to three years. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert knitter or particularly advanced or anything like that, but now I have a bit more confidence to, to try things that a few years ago I, I would have been scared to try. Well, I hope that's answered the, the questions. If you have any more questions, please feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll try and get those answered in my next video. But I wish you all a very happy February. Uh, for those of you under winter conditions, uh, keep safe and keep warm. And let's hope that spring isn't too far away. Bye bye. So we hope you enjoyed that segment with Rachel. Thank you, Rachel, so much for answering all those questions. Mm -hmm. We are a curious bunch, which is good. Um, so we have some new things to show. Yeah. Um, we have Bichet Bouche, which we already stock in the Le Petit um, lamb's wool and um, their mohair, their mm -hmm. silk mohair. So now we have their uh, Le Gros or Le Gros lamb's wool, which is, is this a worsted weight? I believe it is. We just got this in. It literally gets <laughs> shoved in the door as we're recording. Yes. <laughs> um, it's either a worsted or an Aaron. I think it's a worsted 210 yards per 100 grams it's a it's kind of a worsted i think anyway it's lamb's wool and it feels really nice yes. so this is a french um family who um operate out of france but they um get their wool from uh scottish lambs and they make this lovely yarn i believe it's made in scotland too made in the uk yeah so this color here that I'm showing you is light pink and it's got lots of other colors in it, which is nice. I have the undyed dark gray brown. Mm. These are really nice. Really good. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Speaking of shopping at the shop. <laughs> burgundy gray. So I think this is a burgundy dye over dye on a gray base is what that means. Oh, that's so juicy. I love it. I almost picked this out, but I'm not because there's a little bit of veg matter in there. Oh. Just in there. Oh. <laughs> oh. Like the more veg matter, the better. I know. I love the grays and I love this. This is uh, light pink violet. And there's so many colors in this. Just lovely. It's pretty. This one is medium violet. I like this. <laughs> that's so pretty. That's very I thistly. Like this purple. Yeah. This is beige, <clears throat> but look at all the different colors going into that. Very oatmeal-y beige, I would yeah. say. Lovely. Great. I love this color. This one is dark blue turquoise. Ah, it's so pretty. Depth of color. And you'll notice that this is a ball versus oh, the skein. The so they're just um, in the process of transitioning from skeins to balls. Uh, both so, are 100 grams. So they're exactly the same. Yeah. Um, they just... Some our, of our stock is still skeined and some is balls. Yeah, that's the way they're coming to us as they yeah. move through. Um, and same with the petite lamb's wool. We, mm -hmm. we noticed that too. Yeah. This is medium red, which is nice and bright. Mm -hmm. Kind of a solid red. Look at, look at that. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And then the medium green. Ooh, my God. Christmas. I know. Yeah. That's I think great. in the Nordic Knitting Primer, there's a sweater that I think has these two. Aha! Another, another color as well. Might be the blue, and then there's like a cream base, which I think maybe we were not able to get the cream. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So yeah. we will keep adding colors to this line yep. as we're able, um, and then medium blue. Very nice. Oh, it's so pretty. So this this weight of yarn is brand new to us, um, but we are seeing it being knitted around, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, you mentioned. Uh, Kristen's book oh and also um, so many of you enjoyed Kristen's interview uh, which is lovely she is a wealth of knowledge and um, prolific knitter to knit all of the stuff that went in went in that book in about a three month period I don't know how I don't know I have she no that. idea how she did that but she did and um, so yes we we really enjoy Kristen she does a lot of lovely things and uh, we do have our book it might be available when you see this, but currently it's on pre-order because we are waiting for it to come back in uh, from the publisher. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else do we want to talk about before we go to our next video? 
Um, we do you want to start with ribbon or class? Sure, let's go to ribbon. I think we're almost sold out of ribbon, but we are getting yeah. more. And we just wanted to remind you of this lovely ribbon. This is authentic Norwegian ribbon, and it's milled in a little factory in Norway. So this isn't handmade. It is made in Norway, though, in a traditional fashion. Mm -hmm. And these are traditional designs. They're really pretty. So we have a, a number of different styles. Yeah. Um, I like this blue, but I'm yeah. a blue gal. But, yeah. Yeah. I like that little pop of color in the middle, though. Yeah so pretty yeah and the back side i know the back side is almost as pretty as the <laughs> i actually sewed like, on i sewed one on back like to that's front the front that's back both I to undo it. my eyes <laughs> not good so we will be restocking this and getting yep. more in soon um, yep. if there's a style you want now you can go on the shop and sign up for the back in stock notice exactly and i think um, we are getting a couple of new designs as well mm -hmm. so that'll be fun and then speaking I'm, of new designs here there's Class. Oh, pretty. Oh, these are so, I love these little teeny I weeny ones. These are from Norway also. I don't know if you can see that without it. Um, I don't know if that's in focus, but these are very small little clasps. Um, here's a, here's a bigger one, but these are sort of normal size here. And these are closures for uh, cardigans that you might steak. Um, lovely. This one's pretty big. That is a big um, one, or bigger. bigger. Yeah, yeah. here's another one. So we do have the sizes listed on the website, so yeah. you can know which size you're ordering before you order. Good medium size here. Yeah. Yeah, they're clearly marked on the website, yeah. so be sure to buy what you're really wanting. And uh, these packages are packages of two clasps, so you get a left and a right times two. Yeah, one more here. I don't know if you showed that one or not. I'm not sure. That looks good. That's really pretty. And these are pewter, they're zinc, they're lead-free pewter, so safe pewter. Yeah, and then we have more, we got some additional button styles. Ooh, ooh, it's like a shield. Or a flower. All right, I love this one. It's a little boat. Oh yeah. It reminds me of- Berlin Meg. Yarns, yeah. yeah. Just adorable. Very nice, kind of a Celtic. There's almost, what is, is that a dragon? It kind of looks like it, but I'm not sure. Not sure. Mysterious, but very nice. And another shield looking one. So these are coming in packs of three. Yeah. And again, the sizes for these will be uh, noted on mm -hmm. the listing. Uh, Snowflake. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, these are doing incredibly well. They we're, are. we're happy to have They're them. They're really pretty. And, um, and then I just grabbed some. We've, oh, we've yes. rounded out our offerings for Chowgu, and we're offering more cables, individual cables if you need additional. So this is in addition to, we, we have several of their different knitting, um, their needle sets. Mm -hmm. So now you can expand your needle sets with the various paraphernalia to make it more, even more functional. So yeah, we yep. have cables. Yes, and just be um, sure to, when you're ordering like this one, they're both 30 inch, but you can either get the small size for the smaller needles or the large size. Yeah. So um, yep. it's all on the- There's a lot to think about. You've got to think about the length and then the attachment size and what size yeah. needle it goes for. And then there's additional tightening keys. Um, Those are always good to have. Pins. And then additional stoppers. In case you're like me and you're like, oh, I need that size for a new whip that I have no business starting, but I'm going to anyway. Yes, exactly. Did we get any <laughs> tips as well? I don't think we did. I asked him and I don't. Think okay, we did. so we should so. be getting tips if they didn't come in, so um, so that you know you can make your different cables and needles and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I've been using my um, knitting barbers for for stealing needles out of things. Yeah, <laughs> just putting them on. And then go go use the needles from that project. I actually have a sweater that I ripped off the binding because I wanted to add some length, mm -hmm. and I you know picked up all the stitches on the needles, but I put the needle in backwards. Oh, fun! So I used my knitting barber though, and yeah. I was quickly yeah. on the right track. Yeah, oh, love that. that. Amazing, love that. Um, okay, do we have any new books that we um, want to we share? We have some new books. So we have we've talked about that. Yeah, we talked about. It. Noragon's Twisted Stitch Source Book. Um, and we also picked up her um, Knitted Cable Source Book. Yeah, and for a penny, and for a pound. <laughs> yes. 
Um, and then um, this is also new. Um, we picked up this whole mending. Yep. By Aruna. I'm sorry, I can't see the last. I don't want to remember the last name. Um, but this book just has some really fun um, mending Pretty. in there and ways to embroider and mend and mending socks. Yeah. Um, I've got actually, I've got quite a pile of uh, mending to I do. Love these. I know, I love them too. Do you know Karen from, oh God, now I'm going to forget her Instagram handle? I took a mending class with her. Mm -hmm. She's lovely. She's such a sweet person. Um, but she has these jeans that are literally being held together by her mending. Yeah. They're I so saw warm. those um, the Gorgeous. one time we vended at Squam. Yeah. She was wearing them. Yeah. And I'm like, those They're are amazing. They're spectacular. Yeah. What's her name? I'll put it here. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really loving Nora Gunn's uh, cable dictionary. Um, just pages and pages and pages. Yeah of inspiration which is awesome yeah and i'm sure there's patterns in here too i should probably spend some time just watching cables and maybe that would maybe that would attitude help. about it yeah. yeah but you know i mean i feel a little bit ambivalent about lace usually because i get it wrong but the more you do no yeah. i'm not saying you get it wrong. no 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 i know <laughs> i like Don't lace i actually i like i if i'm gonna pick lace or cables i go lace so to me the trifecta is lace cable work cables are color work and of course, it's always color work. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen those cables that are a different color from the background, though? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. There's somebody in our Ravelry group who's been... I'll see if I can find some projects and insert them here. I'm, I don't remember her Ravelry handle. We're good, I think that's we? one of the things about Ravelry, too, is I feel like there's that little bit of distance. Like, I like our handles, but... I don't know anybody's name. We're right. in the Facebook group because it's all names. I just yeah. have no names. But yeah. anyway, she, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> she has been knitting some amazing two-color cable projects, yep. and the cables just pop. pop. Um, and the way we sort of got really excited about wool and fiber, you can tell she's just in On the a zone. Cable. Yes, yeah. with this just awesome. Um, Go check color. her out. So we'll yeah, put her I'll name see if here I can, too. Um, find her projects and yeah. Put, um, and then yeah, yeah. Her handle and you can go find her work. Yeah, and yeah. Send her some love because they're amazing. It's amazing. Um, and so at the time that this goes live, we still have a week before the cow starts. Yeah. So you still have time to jump in and please do. We want we want to see you knitting yeah. along with us. Yes. But we have this mitten book of Icelandic mittens, which is yeah. So if you're if you're you know looking for projects and you're not quite sure, um, I mean this is a great book. This is a great book. It has so many pretty patterns in here. Yep. Um, and uh, Let Lopi, right? I think Let Lopi, but I think other yarns as well, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Like when I flipped through it, it was more than Let Lopi. Yeah. Um, a lovely book. It is a lovely book. Oh, it's just so simple. I was looking, to, there we go. Yeah. Lovely. So, I actually feel like that's not. See, so they just use a fingering weight. So you could even use like Jameson and Smith. Yeah. So yeah. Um, just for some good ideas, book. good book. Yeah. Um, we still have copies too of the Shetland Wool Week Annual, which has yes. projects in there that yes. would be a great choice. Yes. Do you want to show the tape? Oh, I do. Um, we have some highlighter tape. Um, I don't know if you've never used this. This is actually how I keep track of all my charts. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm moving, moving the tape along. It's great because it doesn't leave any film or anything on the paper and it's easy to move to the next row. And the secret sauce is that you put it on the row above the row that you want to knit because then you see your pattern coming up behind and it matches mm -hmm. your knitting. Yep. But yeah, this uh, unpeels and peels, unpeels and peels. And I don't nice. know if you do this. I usually fold one yes. of the ends yeah. so that it's so easier not, to like, peel. Yeah. 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 So we have it available in six packs and um, single if you're not sure you'll love them. Yeah, but yes, but uh, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. Um, I think that that's else? it. And we got a shout out from the Grocery Girls, which is like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's really exciting. I got a couple of DMs like, did you see? And I was like, no, let me go. We, yes. So thank you so much, Tracy. We know that you shop with us. <laughs> and we appreciate you uh, sharing your shopping um, on, on your podcast. Uh, I love the Grocery Girls. I love, um, you're just really fun and uh, a joy to watch. As we know, because you have a lot of viewers. So thank you so much for that shout out. That was really lovely. 
Well, then it's time for us to say goodbye. But before we go, please watch what's coming up. Maggie, do you want to tell everyone what we have in store for them? We have a segment from um, Kim. Uh, she is from Turning Ground Yoga Studios. Yep. And um, she got in touch and has put together a little yoga segment for knitters. Um, based on how we sort of sit Ugh, and our hunched. posture and um, I think it's a fascinating segment and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, um, she's going to get you up out of your chair and if you feel like doing some yoga that yeah. will benefit your knitting, I think this is great and we're happy to share it. Yeah. And uh, we'll let her take you out. Hopefully you're not asleep by the end of it, that you're ready to go. I think if you're moving, you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, I will say too, I think that having watched it, it's easy enough if you can't for some reason get out of your chair, if you, they're, yeah. you're able to uh, participate and yeah. accommodate yeah um, and yeah we hope you enjoyed the second segment yeah. let us know in the comments for sure and just thanks so much for being here we so appreciate you watching the shelfcast um we we have noticed that we have had an uptick in mm -hmm. um people watching and we really appreciate that please help us spread the word by liking um and giving us a thumbs up and subscribing and thank you so much for that and we will see you in a couple of weeks with lots more and uh, but we'll see you before then when we cast on yeah so talk to you soon take good care and if you go out take your knitting bye bye Hi, Willie Thistlers. My name is Kim and I'm a yoga teacher and a knitter based in central Alberta in Canada. I love knitting. Knitting is a wonderful way to pass the time to create beautiful things for yourself and for others and to work with that woolly goodness. But knitting can have all sorts of side effects on your body. You can get tight shoulders, sore hands, sore back, tight hips, all sorts of aches and pains. And that may make you knit a little less than you want to. But if you use yoga to help stretch out the body and work away those aches and pains, you'll find that knitting becomes a much more comfortable activity and something you can do more of. So that's why I'm here. I'm gonna help you work through those aches and pains and explore knitting through the lens of yoga. So we'll begin our knitting yoga warm up with some very simple ankle and wrist circles. You can do these one at a time or you can do two at a time. When you work your body in all positions, so opposite sides at the same time, then you are also working your brain. And I think you know as well as I that knitting is definitely a mental activity unless maybe you're doing garter stitch. So I've just changed directions, you can too. And switch sides. Warming up the wrists, warming up the ankles, creating more fluid and movement, other direction. Add those joints. Beautiful, you might even be able to feel a little bit of warmth growing at those joints, it's wonderful. Okay, from here, we're gonna do some shoulder circles. One at a time, you can do big circles like this, or if that's not happening for you, you can try smaller circles. But the point is, we want to try and get our whole range of motion involved here. And the reason for that is as the bone it's not at the bone exactly, but as I'm just going to say that for simplicity's sake, but the bone touches the bone in the shoulder, it secretes synovial fluid. We'll go the other way. Synovial fluid is just like the lubrication that you need to keep your bones and joints moving smoothly. I always like to think of the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. Oil can. That's what we're doing right now. We're putting oil into the joints. We'll switch sides so that you can have greater range of motion and more fluid movement. Don't forget to breathe. Breathing in through the nose, breathing out through the nose, opposite direction, and enjoying every part of this movement.
Beautiful. We're going to do a small twist with an arm extension. So bringing the right arm back behind you like so, twist around until probably what stops you is a stretching feeling through the bicep. And then open the hand and stretch the fingers. Good. We'll go the other way over to the left till you feel the stretch. Open the hand, stretch the fingers, and then back to the right. So speed it up and use our breath. Inhale right, exhale left. Inhale right, exhale left. You can even close your eyes. Breathing with the movement. And as you open those fingers wide, you can feel the energy moving down your arm and all the way into your digits. I think there was a cat. Oh, there is a cat. Smokey and Chester will often help me do yoga. Good, last one. And release. Good, now I want you to open and close the hands really fast. To the side, above your head. Perfect. A few neck circles to work out any kinks. If it feels okay for you, you can take the head in a full circle. But if it doesn't feel good, then you want to just do a half circle or a smiley face with your chin. It's nice to close your eyes when you do this. And breathe. Noticing where you might feel tight. And if you come to a tight spot, there's one. Then I'm just going to reach my arm away, hold my head where it feels tight, and wait until that shoulder releases. Big breath. Good, and there we go. Now I want you to take your hands behind your body. Onto, into your back pockets. And then really roll those shoulders back so that there's some opening through the chest. The chest will feel tight. That's because we spend our days in this kind of position. So I want to open the chest up and then bring the hips forward, maybe balancing on the toes, not required, but sometimes fun to do. And then heels come down and a slight bend forward. Still stretching through those elbows, drawing them back behind you. Coming up, forward, stretching, and back. Now you probably notice as you do this that there isn't just a stretch in the chest. There's also a stretch probably in your forearms, which are likely tight from all of that fine needlework. Breathing in as you stretch up. Breathing out as you come forward. Last one. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Coming back to center and do a little breath work continuing to open through the forearms and then the side body. It's quite often we hike our shoulders up and we think that the problem is a tight shoulder when actually it could be the muscles right here, the latissimus dorsi, that are too tight and pulling down and then the shoulders compensating by bringing itself up. So we're going to work all of that out. We're going to start by breathing up. Breathe in arms up over your head. Exhale, bring your hands behind your head and then stretch all the way away from you. You're awkwardly pushing the wall away from you. And then eventually you get a big stretch in the forearm. Inhale up and over, stretching from the hip to the armpit. Inhale, exhale other side. Inhale back to center, and then exhale, arms come down. Inhale up, 
Exhale, arms behind you, then push the walls away. Inhale to the side. Exhale to center. Inhale, other side. Exhale to center and down. Inhale up. Bring the hands behind your head. Push the walls away. Inhale to the side and stretch. Exhale to center. Inhale, other side and stretch. Exhale to center. And then arms come down. We'll do this one more time. Inhale up. Exhale, hands behind your head, push the walls away. Oh. Inhale, stretch to the side, really reach back to center. Inhale, stretch other side, reach, reach, reach. Back to center and exhale. Good. Now we're going to make our way down to the mat. Now make your way down to the mat and find any seated position that feels good. Okay, so I like to sit uh, in easy pose with my legs parallel to each other, but if it feels better to have your knees crossed like crisscross applesauce, then do that. And if it feels nice to have blankets or pillows supporting the outside of your leg, then please put them there. All right, so we're here in a lovely seated position. I'm just going to, we're just going to walk our hands forward. Keep the hips on the floor and hinge forward until you can feel an opening through the outside of the hip, a nice external rotation. We're just going to hold this and breathe. And as we hold, I want you to think about what your intention for today is going to be. I think one of the beautiful gifts of knitting is that it, it is a way to stay focused and stay present, especially if you're doing a complicated pattern. So maybe today's intention could be something like, I'm going to be fully present in the moment. I'm really going to be present as I knit. I'm going to feel the yarn on my fingers. I'm going to smell the woolly goodness. I'm going to appreciate every row as my project incrementally gets a little bit bigger. I'm going to breathe as I knit, and I'm going to be aware of my breath. And I'm going to really embrace how the act of knitting makes me happy. I'm going to feel the joy. One more deep breath, wherever you got down to, is just perfect for today. And then when you inhale, come on up. So quite often at the end of a yoga practice, we do a shavasana, that's corpse pose. You lie there on the mat and you just pretend like you're dead. You let everything relax. You just release and let go, relaxing every single muscle. And if you have time, then I invite you to do that. In fact, it's a good thing to do at any time in the day. But the best part of Shavasana is that it allows your body to assimilate what we practice today, what we've been teaching our bodies. So our shoulders are learning that they want to be open today. Our chest and our forearms are learning that they want to be open today. So if you have time, I invite you to take a short Shavasana and I will leave you here. Thank you so much for practicing with me today. You can find me at turninggroundyoga.com. You can find me on Facebook, Turning Ground Yoga, and Instagram, Turning Ground Yoga. Thank you so much, Thistlers. I'll see you next time. Namaste.